For this lecture, I'm going to go through a survey of different kinds of eukaryotic microbes. Um, these are the different types you see here, fungi, algae, protozoa, and the parasitic helminths, um, or parasitic worms. Now, I'm going to take this opportunity to briefly tell you more details about each one of these organisms and then go into some examples of pathogens in those groups. Um, many times the way this course progress, progresses, we don't get an opportunity to talk as much about the, the eukaryotic pathogens. So I want to make sure we go through and, and just talk about a few representative examples of, of each of these different kinds of eukaryotes. I've also color-coded this lecture to hopefully make it a little bit easier. All of the fungal slides have orange headings, the algae slides have green headings, protozoa purple headings, the helminth blue headings. So hopefully that will help you kind of stay organized as you move through this lecture. All right, fungus first. Um, at least when we're looking at the microscopic fungi, there really are two different types, uh, the unicellular yeasts and the multicellular molds, which grow in what we call hyphae. So a yeast is a round, uh, oval-shaped organism. Again, it's a, a unicellular fungus. Yeast cells are only capable of asexual reproduction. Asexual means one parent, and the offspring is genetically identical to that parent. Molds grow in these long filaments that we call hyphae. These are the long, hairy filaments that you think of when you think of mold. That's actually multiple different cells making these long hyphae. So long filamentous fungi or molds are growing in those, those hyphae structures. Now, some fungus are always a yeast. Other fungus are always growing in hyphae, and some can go either way, and we call them dimorphic. So dimorphic means that it can grow sometimes as a yeast and sometimes in hyphae. It turns out that most of the fungal pathogens are dimorphic, so this is a characteristic of, of fung fungal pathogens, the fact that they tend to be dimorphic. Let's look more closely at yeast cells here. Uh, you can see a, a microscopic picture as well as a diagram of yeast cells. Notice they're sort of uh, oval shaped. They are unicellular organisms, even though you may have a couple connected together. They don't have to be together. They just happen to still be in contact. So they are classified as a unicellular life form. Um, yeast do asexual reproduction again. The process that yeast use for reproduction is called budding. <clears throat> uh, you can see what happens is the daughter cell, the daughter cell is budding off of the surface of the mother cell. Um, it is asexual, one parent giving rise to genetically identical offspring. And so that process is called budding in yeast. Sometimes you get a whole group of yeast cells that are connected together. They've gone through budding, and um, they just happen to still be in contact with one another. You can call that a pseudo-hyphae. Uh, sometimes under the scope it looks a little bit like a hyphae, but it's not really. It's just yeast cells that didn't fully release upon budding. So that pseudo-hyphae at the bottom uh, can develop in some cases. Now for mold morphology here, Molds, these are multicellular fungus. They grow in these long filaments or kind of long hairy strings. We call those hyphae. So the hyphae are these long multicellular filaments that the uh, mold grow in, um, if we look at their shape and structure. Here's a blown up, here's a picture under the microscope of hyphae, these long filaments. Many times you'll see a huge big mass of hyphae where you have just a great big like fur ball of lots and lots of fungus where it's hyphae on top of hyphae on top of hyphae and you get this great big mass um, of hyphae. We would call that a mycelium. So a mycelium is a mass of uh, hyphae. Those mycelium can be immensely large. They, they usually are growing in the soil or on or around soil samples or vegetation. Um, one of the largest that was ever identified was found in the ground uh, in Oregon. 
and it was just under the ground and when they dug down and they found it they went around the edges till they could find the perimeter of that big mass and it was almost a mile in diameter this great big uh, mass of, of fungus this great big mycelium about a, mo uh, a mile in diameter this great big mass um, they estimated it to weigh over four tons so that's a big fungus and they can be very very large now some organisms some fungus, as they grow, they build these little cross walls in their hyphae. We call them septa. So therefore, this organism makes septate hyphae because it puts these little cross walls in the hyphae. This is a non-septate organism. It doesn't put the septa into its hyphae. This is just a way of identifying a fungus, just like you might say that a human has brown eyes or a human has green eyes, differences that help you to identify the human. You might say that a fungus has septate hyphae or non-septate hyphae. Helps you to identify it, whether or not it has those little cross walls periodically in its hyphae. Now fungal nutrition. Fungi are heterotrophs. They are not photosynthetic. Highlight, underline. No photosynthesis in the fungal world. The majority of fungus are harmless saprobes. Um, or decomposers. They're living off dead plants and animals. They're excreting enzymes that digest those large organic molecules into smaller nutrients so that they can absorb those nutrients. Some of them are parasites, but they never have to be parasites. Some of them just happen to have landed on something that's not dead yet. So they're, they're degrading living tissues instead of dead tissues. Um, none of them have to live a parasitic lifestyle, but sometimes they can if they wind up on something that's not dead yet. Fungus are known for being extremely widespread in their distribution. We find them in many different habitats. They tend to handle colder temperatures better than most bacteria can and other microbes. They can handle slight acidity as well, so they are widespread in our environment. Um, you're probably already familiar with this phenomenon. If you were to go home and open up the container of sour cream that's been in your fridge, right? if it's been in there too long, what's likely to grow on it first is a fungus. And that's because fungus can grow in cold temperatures and fungus can grow in acidic environments like sour cream. Um, it'll take a while before bacteria can do that. Reproduction of fungus. Uh, Fungi reproduce by forming spores. Um, now, the exception here are yeasts. Again, yeasts do only asexual reproduction uh, through that budding process. You see that on the left-hand side, bottom picture there. We talked about that a few minutes ago. I want to talk about mold reproduction now. Uh, molds form spores in order to reproduce. Now, while we're here, this is not the same thing as a bacterial endospore. A bacterial endospore or spore is meant to survive harsh conditions and they are extraordinarily hardy. This is a totally different beast. A fungal spore cannot survive anything like the bacterial spores can. They're just there for reproducing. All right, so fungus here, molds, you can see here's this, this mass of hyphae, the mycelium. Uh, molds will create extra little pieces of hyphae that release spores from them and this spore will give rise to new fungus. Okay. Um, all molds are capable of doing some type of asexual reproduction where the one parent gives rise to genetically identical offspring through the release of spores. There are a couple of different kinds of asexual spores. We'll see a picture of this in just a moment. Some molds release conidia for their asexual spores. Some molds release sporangia spores for their asexual spores. So again, this is like saying that some humans are blonde and some humans are brunettes, right? So some molds release conidia as their asexual spores and some molds release sporangia spores as their asexual spores. Now, it appears that most, if not all, of the molds are also capable of a type of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction means two parents, and the offspring is not genetically identical to either parent. Right? 
So this is merging of DNA samples from two different parents together so that you get a brand new combination. And that's uh, sexual reproduction. It appears that most, if not all, molds are also capable of doing sexual reproduction where they form sexual uh, spores. Uh, two individuals come together and form sexual spores. We'll talk more about those in a few moments. Let's look more closely first at the asexual spores, the conidia and the sporangia spores. Uh, here's pictures here of conidia and sporangia spores. These are the asexual spores that molds will produce. Some of them form these, these sporangia spores that form inside of a sac structure. So the hyphae comes up. They form a little sac, and the little sporangia spores are forming inside of that sac. That's one type of asexual mold spore. The other type of asexual mold spore would be called conidia. Conidia, here you have the hyphae coming up, and little pieces of the hyphae are broken off and used as spores. We call those conidia. Here's another example of conidia. Here's the hyphae coming up and little pieces of it are being broken off and used as spores. The difference between a sporangia spore and a conidia is that sporangia spores form inside of a sac. Conidia spores do not form inside of a sac. That's what differentiates them. So again, some molds form sporangia spores for their asexual spores. Some molds form conidia as their asexual spores. Now, the sexual spore is what we use in order to classify fungus. So if we think about the classification scheme, kind of start putting it in your head, which domain are we in if we're talking about fungus? We're, of course, in domain eukarya. Which kingdom are we in if we're talking about fungus? We're in the kingdom fungus. Appropriate scientific term would be mycetae, is the fungal kingdom. One step down would be phylum. Okay. Um, what are the phyla uh, in this kingdom fungus? The phyla are zygomycota, ascomycota, basidiomycota, and chondrichthyomycota. Right, so that's, that's the phylum level. Now that said, for reasons I cannot explain to you, sometimes uh, people who work in the fungal world, we call them mycologists, people who study fungus, they don't use the term phylum. Instead, they use the term division. But they're the same thing. A phylum is a division, and a division is a phylum. I cannot explain to you why they don't play nice and use the same term that everybody else uses, but they don't. They tend to use the term division. So I just want you to recognize that if you see division zygomycota, that's what we're talking about here. That is at the phylum level. All right, so here's the different uh, divisions of fungus, zygomycota, ascomycota, basidiomycota, chondrichthyomycota. How do we know which of these phyla an individual fungus belongs in? In other words, how do we classify them? We classify fungus according to their type of sexual spore. What kind of sexual spore does that fungus produce? That's how we classify fungus. So let's look at some examples here. What makes something a zygomycota? Organisms in the division zygomycota form a sexual spore, move this out of your way here, form a sexual spore called a zygospore. Any mold that forms zygospores would go into this phylum or division of zygomycota. So this is a sexual spore. What happens here is you have two different parents. Sexual spore means two parents. Two different parents. Now in the fungal world, we don't call them male and female. We call them the plus strain and the minus strain. So the two strains here, they have hyphae coming together. Right? Two individuals have hyphae coming together. Where the hyphae come together, they form this sexual spore. Okay? We call that a zygospore both parents donating DNA. Any fungus that forms zygospores falls under the classification zygomycota. 
Some zygomycota make sporangia spores as their asexual spores, and some zygomycota make conidia as their asexual spores. But what makes them a zygomycota is the fact that it forms zygospores for its sexual spores. Let's look at the next division here. The next division is ascomycota. Um, all fungus that are in this group, all that are in this uh, division of ascomycota form what are called ascospores as their sexual spore. So again, you need two parents. In this case, they're showing it in pink and blue. The two individuals come together. It's the plus strain and the minus strain. Where they come together, they send up this little piece of hyphae with a sac and inside of the sac are the ascospores, the sexual spores that have DNA from both organisms. Again, some species inside of the ascomycota division form sporangiospores for their asexual spore. Some of them form conidia as their asexual spore. But all of them that are in this division form ascospores for their sexual spore. In fact, that's what makes it ascomycota. The next group here, or the next division, I should say, this is basidiomycota. The fungus that are in this phylum all form what are called uh, basidiospores. Here's the term down here. Uh, basidiospore, everything in this phylum or division forms basidiospores. Here's how it works. Two individuals, again this is a sexual spore. Two individuals come together, the plus strain and the minus strain. Where they come together, they send up this little structure we call a mushroom. And in the gills of the mushroom, they have their spores and those are called basidiospores. So organisms that form mushrooms and have basidiospores fall under this group of basidiomycota. They're also forming asexual spores that are either conidia or ascospores, but everybody in the phylum basidiomycota forms basidiospores. The last um, division here, these are the, the citrids, the citridiomycota. These are very primitive fungi. Um, they don't have hyphae or yeast. Instead, they, they do have a, an interesting little flagellated spore that's called a zoospore. Um, we don't work with them very much. They're usually water-associated fungus. They don't cause any infections in humans. In fact, I really wouldn't even mention them, except for your lab manual talks about them, and I wanted to make sure I was consistent between the lecture and the lab. Um, there are some frog pathogens in this group, but nothing that's, that's harmful to humans. All right. So if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the classification of fungus, don't worry, we're going to go back through all of that stuff in, in lab. Um, when we go through all of the eukaryotic microbes in week three in lab, we're going to go through and I'll work our way through it again. Um, the main take-home message is that all of the molds have some sort of asexual spore, either sporangiospores or conidia, and the molds also form a sexual spore, either a zygospore, a basidiospore, or an ascospore. And how we classify them is based on their type of sexual spore. All right, so I will, I will go back through that a little bit um, in week three in lab. The importance of fungi. Why are fungi so important in our environment? Of course, decomposers of dead plants and animals. We know that they are breaking down large organic molecules to return those nutrients to the soil, allowing new organisms to use those nutrients. They are also a primary source of antibiotics. Um, it turns out that antibiotics are made naturally by organisms that live in the soil. Both bacteria and fungus that live in the soil produce antibiotics. And this is really a way of defending against your rivals. Um, just like two lions living out um, on the savanna, two lions are going to fight over a food source, they're going to fight over a mate, they're going to fight over a water source. 
two microbes living in the soil are going to compete with each other as well. And what they do to compete is kill off their rival with antibiotics. So most of the antibiotics that we currently use are made naturally by either a soil bacteria or a soil fungus. Uh, so they are a primary source of antibiotics. That's where we get a lot of them. Fungi are also used in the making of foods. Um, so they, the yeast cells are made to are used to make bread and wine and beer and all sorts of things. Uh, we also use yeast cells very commonly in genetic studies because they are the most simplistic of all eukaryotic cells. The yeast cell is the most simplistic of all eukaryotic cells. It's very handy uh, to do genetic studies in yeast cells. It's a very easy cell to use. Um, they grow quickly, uh, so very common to, to do research uh, in yeast cells. Of course, unfortunately, fungus can have adverse impacts. Um, anybody who, who has ever bought that $5 tiny little bundle of raspberries only to have it mold two days later in your refrigerator. Uh, food spoilage, of course, is a big problem with fungus. Um, some fungi produce toxins. You know that you can't just go eat whatever mushroom you may find. Some of them produce toxins. Um, there's a really serious toxin called aflatoxin uh, that's produced when a fungus grows in and around grain sources. So it's usually a problem for cattle and other animals that eat the feed. Um, as the grain is stored, this fungus can grow on and in it and then uh, release a toxin and it, it can be deadly to the animals. And the other one here, mycoses. Mycoses are fungal infections. You may have noticed already that MYCO, that uh, prefix, is found uh, several times when we're talking about fungus. In fact, it, it means fungus. So, for example, a mycosis is a fungal infection. Mycology is the study of fungus. Uh, if you look back at all of those names of fungus, like zygomycota, ascomycota, the myco indicates that it's uh, talking about fungus. So mycoses here, there are fungal infections. This is a pretty gnarly looking fungal infection here on this foot. Um, so certainly that, that is an impact that they have on our lives. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go through a couple of different examples of mycoses, of fungal infections, um, just kind of to open the door and have you see examples of how these organisms can cause disease in humans. So first off, let's talk about some superficial mycoses. Superficial, of course, meaning surface layer. It's not causing problems deep into the tissue. First one here, dermatophytes. The dermatophytes are a group with several different species in it. Um, you don't need to worry about the individual species here. I just want you to recognize the dermatophytes as their group name. Uh, the dermatophytes can infect the skin, the hair, the nails, uh, and they do that by digesting keratin. You may remember from other classes, keratin is this sort of thick, waxy substance that's on the outside of our skin. It's also on our nails. It's also on our hair. Um, it's sort of a waterproofing layer. Uh, keratin is the reason that you don't dissolve when you take a shower. It waterproofs your skin. Uh, keratin also blocks most organisms from being able to enter through the skin because it's this thick um, coat on the outside that's protecting us. Well, very few things can digest keratin. One of the ones that can is this group called the dermatophytes. So the dermatophytes are digesting keratin. Therefore, they cause infections places where we have keratin. The skin, the nails, the hair. And they can cause um, infections we call tinea. Uh, tinea is just the surface layer infection caused by the dermatophytes. Examples of tinea would be ringworm here. Um, this is an infection of the keratin, the surface layer of the epidermis. Uh, it was called ringworm because it looks almost like little worms forming rings under the surface of the skin, but that's a misnomer. There is no worm here. This is all caused by a type of fungus. Athlete's foot is an example of uh, tinea. 
So is jock itch is an example of tinea. Some causes of dandruff are from the dermatophytes as well. So various different surface layer infections can be caused by the dermatophytes. Another superficial uh, fungal infection that can occur is caused by Candida albicans. Uh, Candida albicans is a yeast. Uh, it is a yeast that is found normally in low levels in both the human mouth and the human vagina. We expect to find Candida albicans in both locations in low numbers. In addition to Candida albicans, this yeast, both the mouth and the vagina also have um, bacteria that live in balance with Candida. So as long as you have both, low levels of each, everything's normal and healthy. That's the way it's supposed to be. If something happens to the bacteria, however, if the bacteria are dying off for some reason, then all of a sudden the yeast has no competition and the candida albicans can grow out of control. Uh, and then you wind up with what's called candidiasis or commonly called a yeast infection. That can occur both in the mouth or the vagina. Um, that's what you're seeing here. This is an example of oral thrush, which is just an oral yeast infection, um, overgrowth by this candida albicans. Same uh, kind of idea for vaginal candidiasis as well. So if you think about how this infection happens, who is at the greatest risk for a candida albicans uh, yeast infection? Who would be at the greatest risk? Commonly newborns. Uh, newborns often will get especially oral thrush. The reason for that is because they may not have the bacteria in their mouths yet to compete. Uh, so if there's no bacteria to compete, then the newborn may wind up with overgrowth of the yeast and candidiasis. Um, as your immune system fails, uh, so AIDS patients, the elderly can wind up with these infections more commonly also um, because of immune issues. And the other one is antibiotic use. If the patient takes an antibiotic that kills bacteria, it could kill off the bacteria that's in the mouth or the vagina, and that allows the yeast to grow out of control as well, uh, causing candidiasis or yeast infections. So again, highest risk would be newborns, immunocompromised, and patients who have been taking antibiotics. Let's look at an example of a subcutaneous fungal mycosis. Uh, this is, the organism is called Sporothrix schnecki. Um, Sporothrix schnecki usually enters the bloodstream through a little cut um, or a scrape. Once it's in the bloodstream, it causes these painful nodules right underneath the skin. Um, it was originally called Rose Gardener's disease because the quintessential way that you got this was you were out gardening. Sporothrix schnecki is common in the soil, just like most fungus are live in the soil. So if you were out gardening and, and you pricked your finger on your rose bush, then that created a little path for Sporothrix schnecki to get down into your bloodstream and set up this, this little infection with the nodules. Um, so that's why they called it rose, gardener, rose gardener's disease. By the way, Sporothrix schnecki is dimorphic. This picture, it's not a great picture, there's a better one in the textbook. You can see it growing here in a hyphae structure, uh, and actually there, there are some that look like it's beginning to grow in a yeast structure as well. Um, there's a better picture of this in your text, but it definitely is dimorphic and is known to grow both ways. Let's look at a worst case scenario here. Um, systemic. There are a couple of fungi that can cause really horrific systemic mycoses. So a handful of fungal species that can cause generally lung infections when you inhale their spores. Excuse me. Um, there are a handful of different ones that it just depends on where you are in the world as to which one you're most likely to encounter. Um, again, these are organisms that live in the soil, so if you happen to be in an area that has histoplasma capsulatum in the soil, then you're more likely to get Ohio Valley fever. If you live somewhere where it has Blastomyces dermatitidis, then you're more likely to get Chicago disease. It's very specific to certain locations, um, wherever that particular fungus lives in the soil. Um, the one I want you to know about 
is in orange here. This is the one you definitely should know. This is Coxioides imitis. Coxioides, the genus, imitis, the species. Coxioides imitis causes what we call San Joaquin Valley fever. Sometimes they just shorten it to valley fever. Um, San Joaquin Valley, of course, is the large agricultural valley that runs right down the center of California. Um, this, this infection appears to be localized around the southwest portion of the United States. Um, you also occasionally see it in Mexico, and you also occasionally see it in, in parts of Central America. Now, this one, Coxioides imitis, this is a, a fungus that's living in the soil. Um, what happens here is you inhale those fungal spores, um, they go to the lung, and they cause a little lung infection. Now, about 40% of patients have some sort of symptoms during this lung infection. It could look like a cold, it could look like a flu. About 1% of patients actually develop bloody sputum, almost like tuberculosis. But uh, roughly half of all patients will have some sort of uh, symptomology during this lung infection. The other half will recover all by themselves, and they, you'll never see that there's an infection. So the good news is that usually patients undergo a complete recovery. Unfortunately, somewhere around five out of every thousand patients um, have a more serious infection. After it's in the lungs for these five out of a thousand patients, it begins to spread to other parts of the body or disseminate, where the fungus is actually moving from the lungs into other body parts. Where can it go? Well, it can go lots of different locations once it enters the bloodstream. It can go to the skin causing nodules. It can go to the bones. It can go to the brain and the meninges. Uh, sometimes you see it in the lymph nodes. It can spread to multiple different sites. That is a very dangerous scenario. Once the fungus is spreading to multiple body parts, now we have a much more serious complication here, uh, much harder to tackle that infection. It, there appears to be about 100,000 cases every year in the southwestern portion of the United States of San Joaquin Valley fever and about 50 to 100 deaths every year uh, from San Joaquin Valley fever. Now, the reason I want you to know about this is because we live very close to the epicenter for this particular infection. The highest proportion of these cases come from Bakersfield, California, which is literally spitting distance from where we are located uh, at the southern tip of the San Joaquin Valley. And that's where most of these infections come from. So we, as, as future healthcare professionals, really should be aware of San Joaquin Valley fever because we live right at the epicenter uh, of this infection. Again, you inhale it, causes a lung infection, half, ha half of the people have symptoms from that lung infection, half don't, and about five out of a thousand will then progress to this disseminated um, version where it spreads to multiple different sites. And you can see in this patient nodules that are here under the skin. Um, and if you were to cut into it, you would see a mycelium, a mass of, of hyphae. Uh, you can see it all the way up, everywhere where there's a lymph node. This patient appears to have a lymph infection is where you see all of these different lumps forming uh, where this infection is going on. Right, that's San Joaquin Valley fever and coxioides imitis. Now, if you think about who's at the highest risk for coxioides imitis, um, the number one are migrant far farm workers. So number one risk is migrant farm workers, which makes sense. They're more likely to be outside, perhaps doing things that would kick up some dust, you know, working in a field or digging or something along those lines, which kicks up dust, and then you inhale those fungal spores. All right. Um, let's talk about the next of the uh, eukaryotic microbes. I want to talk about a kingdom called Kingdom Protista. Um, the protist kingdom, right now there is a lot of disagreement about whether or not there should even be a king kingdom called Protista. Your textbook talks about the problems that they're having. Um, how should we classify the protists? Kingdom Protista originally was this sort of dumping ground for everything that didn't fit into the other kingdoms. If it wasn't an animal and it wasn't a plant and it wasn't a fungus, 
Um, but it was a eukaryote. They just said, all right, we'll put it in protista. We don't really know what's going on there anyway. So they would just sort of shove all of those things into protista. Then as they started to analyze the things that were in protista, they realized that there were sort of two different groups in, in kingdom protista. So they created what they call subkingdom algae for the photosynthetic protists and subkingdom protozoa for the heterotrophic protists or the sort of plant-like protists and algae and the sort of animal-like protists and protozoa. Um, that's how it has been for quite a while. Now as we look at DNA techniques and we start to analyze these organisms' DNA and we start to analyze um, fine differences between them, we're realizing that there's way more crossover than one might expect. For example, there are some protozoans, some protozoans that are actually photosynthetic. And there are some algae that are modal like the protozoans. So it doesn't seem to be as cut and dried as we've always thought it to be. Um, what's going on now in, in this area is everybody's arguing. How should we classify them? How should we think of the protists? Should we have kingdom algae and kingdom protozoan? Or should we have multiple different kingdoms? Uh, some people say that there should be two kingdoms, algae and protozoa. Some people say that there should be as many as 11 different kingdoms to, to put all of these different protists in, in an appropriate way. Again, that's all being discussed. There is no consensus now. I don't want you to have to memorize systems that probably are not going to hold true uh, for, for very long. So we're going to kind of go with the old school way of doing it. Uh, we're going to talk about subkingdom algae and subkingdom protozoa, but I want you to be aware of the fact that there's, it's not so cut and dried. There's crossover between them. And in fact, in the eukaryotic assignment, I have you go through and discuss uh, what problems they're having in that classification system. I'll talk more about this uh, in the UK lab uh, during week three, but this is sort of just to prep you for the fact that while I'm going to tell you very specific sub-kingdoms, uh, not everybody in the scientific community would, would say this is the way they should be classified. All right, there's my disclaimer. Kingdom protista. If we look at kingdom protista, we'll divide that up into sub-kingdom algae and then sub-kingdom protozoa. Let's talk about the algae first. The algae are all photosynthetic. And because they're photosynthetic, of course, they have chloroplasts to run that photosynthesis. Uh, remember that pigments are required for photosynthesis to occur. Pigments are what actually captures light photons during photosynthesis. So um, all algae have some sort of pigmentation to them. They're green or they're red or they're orange or they're brown, but they have some pigmentation to them so that they can absorb light. Um, most of the algae have a cell wall. What the cell wall is made of it differs widely between them, but they do have some sort of cell wall. There's variety in lifestyle here. Some algae are unicellular, some are colonial, some are multicellular. Um, most of them are living in fresh and marine water. Uh, they're all water associated. So they're either living in a freshwater source like a lake or a pond, or they're living in a marine environment in the ocean, or they're living in a very humid environment. They must have lots of water in order for them to uh, grow. Now, how we classify the algae. Don't worry so much about this uh, slide and all the different groups now. We will buzz through them quickly in the lab. Um, these are the groups that, that we look at for algae, the different kinds of algae. What I want you to know for this lecture is I want you to know how we classify algae. If these are all the different groups of algae, how does a researcher know which group their organism belongs in? Here are the things that are usually used. First, pigment. What kind of pigment? Second, cell wall structure. What's used to make that cell wall? And food storage. How does that organism store its food? 
Those are the three things that are mainly used to classify the algae. What kind of pigment it has, what kind of cell wall it has, what kind of food storage process it uses. Um, so for example, chlorophyta are green algae and rhodophyta are red algae. And so they have different ways of classifying them based on those three different uh, pieces of um, information. We'll go through some more detail about the individual uh, groups in lab. The only ones that I really want to call your attention to here, first off, um, the rhodophyta. We're going to talk more about rhodophyta in a moment. That's red algae. The reason that rhodophyta is important to us is this is where we get auger from. Auger is actually isolated from the red algae, the rhodophyta. Um, I also want you to recognize the diatoms here, or bacillariophyta. The diatoms are really important to us. Diatoms are these tiny little, there's a picture here, are these tiny little algae and they store their food as oil. Uh, this is actually our petroleum source, so when we, we pump oil out from the bottom of the ocean, we're actually grabbing little dead diatoms and taking the oil from inside of them. Um, so they're really important for that. And the other group that we're going to talk more about in just a moment here are the dinoflagellates. Those are the only ones that really have any medical re relevance. Um, the dinoflagellates here can cause uh, a, food, a poisoning event that I'll talk about in just a minute. So those are the dinoflagellates. And this is a picture, by the way, of a dinoflagellate. All right, so the importance of algae. Um, algae provide the basis of the food web in most aquatic habitats, so uh, they are a large portion of what's called plankton. Um, plankton is a rich nutrient mix uh, containing algae as well as tiny little marine invertebrates, um, and together that is the, the food, the, the basis of the food web. Most things feed off plankton or feed off something else that fed off the plankton. Algae, of course, being photosynthetic, also produce a large proportion of atmospheric oxygen. They're releasing lots of oxygen during their photosynthesis. So um, the algae that live in the ocean and, and other aquatic environments are releasing huge amounts of oxygen. Algae are used for cosmetics, food, and medical products. I was telling you that rhodophyta, uh, the red algae, is where we get auger from. Auger is not only used in a micro lab, it's also used as a solidifying agent in cosmetics and food products. Um, the diatoms are also really useful, of course, because diatoms is where we get gas from. They also use diatoms as an abrasive. They used to use it in toothpaste, but not so much anymore. But you see it in like water filters, and you see it in car polish. You'll see diatoms. The only one that's really medically um, important here are the dinoflagellates. The dinoflagellates are algae that have a, a reddish-orange hue to them. That's the color that they are. Um, during what's called a red tide event, the dinoflagellates are growing out of control. So it would cause them to grow out of control. This is called an algal bloom. So what causes this algal bloom? Well, think about the things that encourage growth. Lots of nutrients in the water, um, high temperature of the water. These are sorts of things that tend to encourage growth. During some of these uh, environments where there's lots of water or there's uh, lots of nutrients, I'm sorry, lots of water, lots of heat or nutrients, and that causes this algal bloom where you have a lot of dinoflagellates growing out of control, dividing, and they literally turn the water red. There are so many of them that the water looks red. There are so many dinoflagellates. Now that in itself sounds pretty cool, but the, the dangerous portion is when they're in high numbers like that, the dinoflagellates begin to release toxins, and those toxins can cause what we call paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, as fish swim through these red tide waters, uh, they become paralyzed, and if they can't swim, they can't breathe, and then they literally suffocate in the water. Tiny little marine invertebrates like shrimp and uh, clams and oysters and mussels feed off the algae in the water. So they would be feeding off of those dinoflagellates during a red tide event and that would poison them. 
larger marine organisms, seals, otters, things along those lines, will then go and eat those um, shrimp and mussels and clams, and then they can be killed by this shellfish poisoning toxin as well. So this is a pretty serious uh, situation. Unfortunately, humans can be affected by it also. Generally, it's not deadly to humans, but it's a pretty serious event to have paralytic shellfish poisoning. And unfortunately, cooking does not destroy the toxin. So uh, if you, even if you cook the seafood thoroughly, it still does not uh, completely destroy the toxin. It's still active. So you never, never, never swim in a red tide. You never, never eat seafood when there's been a red tide. Um, they generally have red tide warnings. You know when it's happening on local beaches. Uh, it's always something to keep in mind. Now... Remember in Kingdom Protista, we were just talking about the algae here, the subkingdom algae. Let's talk about subkingdom protozoa. Subkingdom protozoa, these are heterotrophs, no photosynthesis. They do ingest, um, or in some cases, absorb their food. Uh, they're not photosynthesizing. Most of them do not have a cell wall. And, of course, they don't have chloroplasts. If they're not photosynthesizing, they don't have chloroplasts. Um, I believe they're all unicellular. I really should update that. I can't think of any multicellular protozoans. So, really, that should just say unicellular. Most have some sort of motility structure. Um, most of the protozoans are motile. Either they have a flagella or they have cilia. We'll look at some of the other examples in a moment, but they're motile somehow. Most of them are free living, but there are some parasites. So um, we'll look at a couple of examples of parasites that can cause infections in humans. Now the protozoan life cycle. Um, protozoan life cycle here, protozoans alternate between two different forms, what we call the trophozoite and the cyst. So two different forms of a protozoan. It's either a trophozoite or it's the cyst form. And the protozoan alternates between trophozoite cyst, trophozoite cyst, trophozoite cyst. It alternates back and forth very similarly to like a butterfly, right, which is a worm, uh, a larva, a pupa, then the butterfly, and then back. Um, that's the same kind of idea. This is how it alternates between these two different forms, from a cyst to a trophozoite. Now, what controls which um, stage that the organism is in, that has to do with its environment. In nutrient-rich uh, environments, then the organism will live as a trophozoite. The trophozoite is the active feeding stage. It's the modal stage where the organism is moving around, it's going through its metabolism, it's going through cell division to give rise to new cells. All that stuff is happening at the trophozoite. If the conditions get bad, drying out or lack of nutrients, then that protozoan will go into the cyst phase. The cyst is a dormant resting stage. There's no metabolism going on. There's no uh, cell division going on. It's just hanging out, waiting for conditions to improve. Now, the cyst does have this uh, sort of structure around it, protecting it, this wall around its, its cell. Uh, so it tends to be much hardier and more difficult to kill than the trophozoite. All right, so protozoans go back and forth between these two forms, what's called a trophozoite and a cyst, the trophozoite, trophozoite being the active feeding stage, the cyst being the resting dormant stage. It's a little bit tougher to kill. Uh, and the environment controls whether the organism is in the trophozoite stage or the cyst stage. Now, how do we classify protozoans? Right? We know if we think about our classification scheme here, we are in domain eukarya, kingdom protista, subkingdom protozoa, underneath subkingdom, how do we classify them? Um, what's used to classify protozoans is usually its form of motility or locomotion. How is this organism moving? 
those that fall into the, the phylum Mastigophora, Mastigophora all move by flagella. Those that, that fall into the phylum Sarcodina all move as an amoeba. They're amoebas. Those that fall into the phylum Ciliophora all move with cilia. They're the cilia. Those that fall under this last one, the AP complexa. The AP complexa are all parasites and they don't have a very good motility. In fact, most of them are non-modal at all. Some have short life or uh, short time periods where they're modal. Um, we'll talk more about those in a second. Now your lab manual does not use these terms, um, mastigophora, sarcodina, ciliophora. Instead, they use the more simplistic term flagellate amoeba ciliate. Um, I'm going to be fine with you learning these terms. Again, I want to be consistent between what we're doing with lecture and lab. So if you consider these the flagellates, the amoebas, the ciliates, and the epicomplexa, that's fine with me. I'm giving you both terms here because the scientific term really should be the ones on the left, um, but I realize that your lab manual is using these, so I'm going to be okay with you using these as well. So when you answer the questions for the eukaryotic assignment or in a test scenario, these are the terms that you can use, and I will use them also, trying to make things uh, consistent. All right, so how do we classify protozoans? We classify protozoans according to their mode of locomotion or how they move uh, into one of four different phyla, the flagellates, amoebas, ciliates, or apicomplexa. Let's go through, through some examples of each of these different uh, phyla. Let's talk about some flagellate pathogens first. Uh, the first one here, Trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas being the genus name, vaginalis being the species name. This is a, a reproductive tract parasite, so it is spread via sexual contact. The interesting thing about Trichomonas vaginalis is that it never forms a cyst. This is one of the weird exceptions of protozoans where this particular organism, Trich vaginalis, never forms a cyst. It only exists as a trophozoite. So what that means in a practical sense is that you cannot pick this infection up from anything other than direct sexual contact. Trichomonas vaginalis does not um, infect people from toilet seats or towels or hot tubs or any of that stuff because it doesn't survive outside the human body because uh, so, it never forms a cyst. So Trichomonas vaginalis is spread only through direct sexual contact. Uh, you can see a picture of it here, the classic view and description of trick vaginalis. To see how it has this sort of undulating membrane on one side of it. Um, as, you, as you watch these organisms swim, they have this sort of falling leaf structure where they kind of um, wiggle and, and glide across the screen as you're looking at them under the scope. It's very, very indicative of what's going on during an infection. All right, another flagellated pathogen here, Giardia lamlia. Giardia lamlia does form a cyst and a trophozoite both. Here you see the trophozoite form of Giardia. Here's the cyst form. This is an intestinal parasite and it's transmitted via contaminated water. Um, what happens here is that this organism is, can be found in the gastrointestinal tract of wild animals. Uh, so a possum, a skunk, a wolf, whatever. Uh, this could be found in their, their gastrointestinal tract. When the animal defecates, it releases cysts in the feces. So as it defecates, it releases cysts in its feces. Um, animals tend to be attracted to water sources for, for water. Um, and if they're attracted into that area, they're also likely to be urinating and defecating in the area. So the cysts, what I'm telling you, the cysts can wind up in the water source. You go and you drink this water and you ingest that cyst and the cyst turns into a trophozoite in your gastrointestinal tract. So you ingest the cyst, turns into a trophozoite in your gastrointestinal tract, and you get one raging case of diarrhea. Cysts would be released in your feces as well during this infection. 
So it's an intestinal parasite that's tra transmitted via contaminated water, where you ingest the cyst in that water, uh, and it turns into a trophozoite in your GI tract um, during that infection causing gastroenteritis. Now, Giardia lamblia, you've probably heard that you shouldn't drink out of mountain streams before, and this is why. Uh, Giardia lamblia is the reason, because we know that it's commonly found in, in streams and rivers in our environment, uh, because wild animals can carry this and release cysts in their feces. All right. Another flagellate pathogen here, one that we're hearing more and more about. Uh, I, I didn't used to lecture on this one until uh, we really are starting to have a bigger problem with this particular organism than we used to. The genus here is Trypanosoma. The Trypanosomas are blood parasites that rely on an insect vector. In other words, this insect is going to move um, our little protozoan around. It's going to move the trypanosoma around. There's a couple of different ones that can cause problems in humans, but the one I want to talk about is trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma cruzi causes what's called Chagas disease. Uh, Chagas disease is a huge problem in South America, uh, Central America, and now we're starting to see it in North America as well. Uh, and Trypanosoma cruzi is transferred via a bug called the Reduvid bug. Uh, the Reduvid bug is also commonly called the kissing bug. The reason they call it the kissing bug is because it likes to bite you around your mouth. I have no idea why that is. Uh, I, I always get that question and I, I guess I should look it up. I don't know how they know where they're biting or why they choose to bite around the mouth, but that's a very common location. They tend to bite people around the mouth. <coughs> so they call it the kissing bug. <coughs> All right, here's how it works. Trypanosoma cruzi, this flagellated protozoan. The reduvid bug or kissing bug will bite you, right, it will bite you somewhere around the mouth, and while it's on the surface of your skin, it's also going to release feces, right, as the bug's crawling around on your skin, it's also going to release its feces. Um, the feces contain the trophozoite form of Trypanosoma cruzi. So in that bug's gastrointestinal tract is the trophozoite, and so as it crawls around on you, it releases that trophozoite in its feces. Well, the feces itch, so the human will scratch, scratch, scratch wherever those feces are, and that actually moves the feces down into the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, that could go anywhere, right? Bloodstream can, tra can travel everywhere, so of course the trypanosoma could go anywhere, but its very favorite location to go is into the muscle fibers of the heart, and it will form the cyst between the muscle fibers of the heart. So Trypanosoma cruzi, um, the reduvid bug releases the, the trophozoite form, it's scratched into the bloodstream, and then it turns into the cyst form between the muscle fibers of the heart. Right. Now, I'm hoping you know enough about anatomy and physiology to know that this is not what a human heart should look like. Um, there's, it's grossly uh, oversized. There, it should be cut off right. If I can get my arrow to work here, should be cut off somewhere right around in here, right, and on this side somewhere up and around here. Right. So it's almost twice the size that it should be uh, in this diagram. And the reason is because all of those little cysts are forming between the muscle fibers and, and making this huge enlarged heart. Well, as you can imagine, the heart cannot function correctly when it has these cysts in between its muscle fibers. And in fact, Trypanosoma cruzi and Chagas disease, which is what this infection is called, is a primary cause of heart disease um, in South America. So it's a huge common issue uh, that they see in, in parts of South America and now all the way up into North America as well. So how to control this? How to try and keep people from getting this infection? If you think about what would be the easiest way to prevent this infection, generally what people are trying to do is vector control. 
we want to kill off the reduvid bug. Uh, if the reduvid bug never has the opportunity to bite you, you're never going to get Chagas disease. Uh, so, so that's the main push is to try and get rid of that reduvid bug so that people don't wind up with this infection. Uh, vector control is the main way of doing that. We have now seen this again in South and Central America, but it also has been documented in Mexico and parts of Texas. We're starting to see Chagas disease as well. In fact, a couple of years ago, Chagas disease showed up in the blood supply. We never used to check for Chagas disease, but all of a sudden um, they began to realize that blood that was being transfused between patients had that trophozoite of trypanosoma in it. Uh, so don't know exactly what happened. It could have been that, that somebody who donated blood was a recent immigrant from some portion where of the world where this infection occurs, or it could be that it was someone who just came back from a trip to South America. Don't know how it happened, uh, but apparently the blood supply was contaminated with Trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, now we are testing for it, so it shouldn't be a problem again, so now we test all blood for Trypanosoma cruzi, but that was a real wake-up call uh, that this infection is spreading out of the parts of the world where we used to think um, you could get it into other parts, including um, North America. All right, let's look at an amoeba pathogen. Now an amoeba, an amoeba moves, inst instead of with a flagella or anything, the amoeba moves through what's called amoeboid motion. We'll talk about this more in lab. Uh, what it does is it, it sends out what are called pseudopods. These are little projections from the surface of the cell. It sends out those pseudopods and then the cell moves to join the pseudopods. So it's like a big pile of, of Play-Doh or goo where it sends out a little projection and then slurps the rest of the cell up to that projection. That's how it moves through this amoeboid motion. Um, I, there was this old movie that I used to watch that I loved it. It was called The Blob Takes Manhattan and it was this great big blob of goo and it was huge and it was it was t it was uh, overtaking Manhattan. It was sliming over buildings and it was absorbing taxi cabs as it went. Just kind of a big pile of goo moving over the city. Um, it's always made me think of an amoeba. That's exactly how an amoeba moves. It sends out little projections and then slurps the rest of the cell up to it. That's how it moves. All right, so an example of a pathogen from this group, uh, this amoeba group. The best example would be Entamoeba histolytica, uh, histolytica being the species, Entamoeba being the genus. It causes what's called amoebic dysentery, uh, amoebic dysentery. Dysentery is like diarrhea, but there's tissue loss on top of it. It's not just the diarrheal fluids, but there's tissue being lost in addition. Blood, uh, surface layer of the intestinal tract, something like that is coming out along with the diarrheal fluids. This is an infection that's found all over the world. What happens is one person who's infected is releasing cysts in their feces. Well, they go to the bathroom, don't wash their hands, and then they make your sandwich, right? You then ingest those cysts along with your contaminated food or water, and in your gastrointestinal tract, it forms the trophozoite, which is the amoeba, and can cause dysentery. So that's generally, it's acquired through ingesting contaminated food or water. You get the cysts from that food or water. Let's look at a ciliate here. Ciliate are protozoans that move with those tiny little hairs or cilia. Uh, beating those, those cilia allow them to move through the media. There are very few pathogens in this group. Uh, in fact, I was sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel to find even one. I don't even have him highlighted because I don't think that he's as big a deal as the other pathogens that we talk about here. Uh, but for completeness sake, I wanted to present you with a ciliated pathogen, a protozoan that moves by cilia and can theoretically cause infection in humans. This is Balantium coli. Uh, Balantium coli can infect human intestines and cause diarrhea. It's usually found in pigs. It's not commonly seen in humans. Um, 
generally when it is transferred to humans it's somebody who's working in close association with the pigs so a rancher a slaughterhouse worker a vet somebody like that is, is who's most likely to acquire balantium coli um, again not a very common infection but it is caused by a ciliate an organism that moves by uh, cilia let's talk about an apicomplexa now Apicomplexa, I want to remind you that this group, uh, these t are generally non-modal protozoans. They're not, they don't have much motility, and they have extremely complex life cycles. Right? Most of the protozoans that we talk about go back and forth between trophozoite, cyst, trophozoite, cyst. That's the general process for a protozoan. For an apicomplexa, however, things tend to be much more complex. Uh, multiple hosts, multiple different forms of the organism, things are much more complex. So we're going to use uh, the example of plasmodium, which causes malaria. Uh, and we'll go through the, the bits and pieces here of how, of how this works. But I just wanted you to be aware that the apicomplexa phylum um, is, are all very complex life cycles, all parasites, and tend to be non-modal. All right, let's look at our example here for an apicomplexa. Um, the genus Plasmodium, this genus can cause, uh, has several different species in it. Uh, four different species from that genus can cause malaria. Um, the disease characteristics are almost identical regardless of which species is causing the infection. Uh, so I don't even want to worry about the species level names. I just want you to recognize that the genus Plasmodium causes malaria. And it does this through a mosquito vector. Now it turns out in this life cycle we're going to see some, some really um, unusual things. First off, the organism alternates between two forms, what's called the sporozoite and the merozoite. It's not just trophozoite and cyst, instead it's sporozoite and merozoite. The organism also alternates between doing asexual reproduction sometimes and sexual reproduction other times. The organism also alternates between two different hosts the mosquito and the human. In fact, malaria, the disease, cannot exist unless there are mosquitoes and humans both. Plasmodium can't go through its life cycle unless it has both mosquitoes and humans. So really interesting here. This organism has two forms, the sporozoite and merozoite, two forms of reproduction, asexual and sexual, and two different hosts, the mosquito and the human. Let's see how this works. First off, right, uh, number one here, the mosquito bites the human, and as the mosquito bites the human, it injects the sporozoite form of plasmodium. Turns out that mosquitoes, when they bite, they actually spit a little bit of their saliva into the human before they start to drink the blood. They do that because they have some anticoagulants in their saliva, so it allows the blood to flow well and into their, their bodies. Uh, well, when they spit into the human, they inject the sporozoite form of plasmodium. So picture one, mosquito bites the human and injects the sporozoite form of plasmodium. Number two, the sporozoites, now that they're in the human, they specifically go to the liver and the red blood cells. Right? So the sporozoites are going to the liver and the red blood cells inside of the human. Now the sporozoites, number three, are going to go through asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction in both the liver cells as well as in the red blood cells produce what's called the merozoite form. So merozoite forms are, are produced, oops, sorry about that. Uh, the merozoite forms are produced during this asexual reproduction that occurs in the red blood cells as well as the liver. Now you have these merozoites floating around in the bloodstream. Next, next mosquito, mosquito number two, is going to come in and take a blood meal. As he ingests the blood, he's picking up merozoites. 
right? So he ingests the mosquito and the mosquito, I'm sorry, the mosquito ingests the blood, including the merozoites in the blood. Inside of the mosquito, the merozoites go through sexual reproduction and form sporozoites. So that happens inside of the mosquito. Now we're ready for that mosquito to go and find the next human and inject those sporozoites into the blood and the cycle can continue. So notice we have alternating between host, human versus the mosquito. We have alternating be between forms, sporozoites versus merozoites. And we have alternating between type of reproduction, sexual reproduction which happens in the mosquito and asexual reproduction that happens in the human. So the mosquito bites the human and injects those sporozoites into the bloodstream. Sporozoites go to the liver and the red blood cells. In the liver and red blood cells, the sporozoites go through asexual reproduction to form merozoites. Merozoites are ingested by the next mosquito, and the merozoites go through sexual reproduction in that mosquito to form sporozoites. That's the process of malaria um, that goes over and over and over again. Now, how is this so harmful to the human? Um, of course, you can imagine there, there's considerable amount of liver damage uh, that's going on during this infection, but really what's even more dangerous is the damage to the blood. If you think about what blood does, red blood cells carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. If you are destroying huge numbers of red blood cells, that starts to cause multi-organ damage because the blood can no longer get oxygen to all of the other organs. So all of the organs begin to suffer because the red blood cells are being killed off during this process. You can also see significant uh, kidney damage that occurs because as those, those blood cells are destroyed, they literally get caught in the kidneys. So you start to see kidney damage developing from uh, malaria as well. Fever, uh, weakness, poor circulation, those sorts of, infection, those sorts of symptoms are, are common with malaria. We tend to think of malaria as being an ancient disease that, that's no longer a problem, but that is absolutely not true. There are 500 million cases of malaria per year uh, over worldwide, so that's a considerable number of people who become infected by malaria every single year, 500 million. Uh, there are 2 million deaths every year due to malaria, so it is a serious problem. Um, malaria only exists in certain parts of the world because, again, you have to have the right type of mosquito for this organism to go through its life cycle. Not all mosquitoes will, will allow this process to occur. So you do have to have the right kind of mosquito for the process to occur. So what can we do to get rid of malaria? Most of what we can do has to do with vector control. Try to get rid of the mosquitoes um, and prevent people from getting bitten by mosquitoes. This is a picture of a blood smear, and in this blood smear, you can see um, the organisms in what, what's called the ring stage. Uh, these are the red blood cells, and, and they're actually going through their uh, reproduction in order to form merozoites. They're going through their asexual reproduction and forming merozoites. And then as the merozoites are released, um, when, the red, when the red blood cell bursts, the merozoites are released here. Uh, so generally it's diagnosed with a blood smear. Take a blood sample, look under the scope, and you can see those, those uh, ring stage of the organism inside of the red blood cells. All right. The last group of eukaryotic pathogens here are the helminths or the parasitic worms. So if you think about the classification here, we are again in domain eukarya. Now we're in kingdom onomalia. The helminths are a type of multicellular animal, just like we are. Uh, they do have organs for reproduction, digestion, movement, protection. Um, they can react to their environment. They are all parasites by their very definition. Helminths are parasitic worms. All of the helminths here have some sort of mouth part. Sometimes the mouth is, is the beginning of their digestive tract, just like it is for us. In other cases, the mouth part is just for attachment. It's like a great big sucker uh, that holds on to the host. 
Most of the helminths have well-developed sex organs. They produce eggs and sperm to go through sexual reproduction. And the basic uh, pattern or life cycle here of a helminth is you have the egg and then the larva and then the adult. Right? So if we think of protozoans as being trophozoite cyst, trophozoite cyst, helminths are egg, larva, adult. Egg, larva, adult, egg, larva, adult. That's how they go through their life cycle. How do we classify the helminths? The helminths are classified into three different groups. Uh, it mainly has to do with their body structure. The flatworms here, the flatworms are called that because they're um, flat. <laughs> uh, they don't have a defined body cavity. Um, they don't have a true digestive tract the way we do. Instead, they absorb nutrients through their cuticle, which is this outer layer of their body wall. So they're just going to absorb nutrients. They're these flat little worms that absorb nutrients. They don't actually ingest things through a mouth. There are two different types of flatworms. The cestodes are the segmented flatworms. Tapeworm would be an excellent example of a cestode. It's a flatworm that's in segments. The trematodes, also called flukes, are flat, non-segmented worms. They sort of look like a leaf. That's what I always think they look like, is a little leaf structure. They're flat. They don't have the segments. Right. The other type of Helminth is the nematode, uh, the nematode or the round worms. The nematodes are round, just like an earthworm, really. Uh, and they do have a complete digestive tract. They do have a mouth. They do have the gastrointestinal tract, and it ends in an anus, very similar to our gastrointestinal tract. So they're not using their mouth parts for attachment. Instead, they're using their mouth parts as the beginning of their digestive tract. They have little spines and hooks. Um, in order to attach to the host, uh, since they're not using their mouth for that process. All right, let's look at some examples here of helminth pathogens. We'll look at a cestode first, uh, a tapeworm first. Uh, the tania genus here, um, this is the genus tania. There are several species in that genus uh, that can cause infections in humans via meat that has the larva in it. The picture that you're looking at here is the beef tapeworm. So Tania is the genus. The species is Saginata. I'll spell that for you. The species is S-A-G-I-N-A-T-A. -A -A. So Tania saginata is the beef tapeworm. There is another tapeworm that goes through a very, very similar process. It's uh, Tania solium, which is S-O-L-I-U-M. That's the pork tapeworm. So we're going to look at Tania saginata, but yes, it's true that Tania solium has a very similar life cycle. Here's how it works. All right. The cow. The cow ingests eggs. The eggs are in the grass. The cow ingests the egg. And inside of the cow, the egg becomes larva. And the larva is hypermodal. Uh, it can move all over the place inside of the cow. It can move to lots of different locations. A common place for that larva to go, however, is to go to the muscle of the cow. So here we have the cow ingested the egg. It became hypermodal larva, and it settled in the muscles. Now, the human ingests a undercooked beef, right? Hamburger, steak, whatever it is, ingests that larva, right? And in the gastrointestinal tract of the human, the larva becomes the adult tapeworm. Eggs are released from that tapeworm, wind up in the grass for the cycle to continue. That's the basic cycle for uh, Tania saginata, is the cow ingests the egg, the egg becomes a larva inside of the cow's muscles, the human ingests the larva, and the adult develops in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, here's a picture of, of a tapeworm. Here's the actual 
head, I suppose you could call it, um, of the tapeworm. It has this really scary looking structure with hooks and suckers where it can attach to the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and then remember, it doesn't have a mouth for ingesting food. Instead, the tapeworm is going to absorb nutrients right across its body wall, its cuticle. So it's just simply absorbing those nutrients through the, the um, structure of the tapeworm. Uh, I had a teacher in high school who told us about how when he, I can't remember where he was, um, I think it was in Indonesia, he saw a, a, um, a little tin uh, f like with diet pills uh, in it, so for women who wanted to lose weight. And he was so curious, he bought it, and then he opened it up, and it was a tapeworm larva that you were to ingest, and then the larva would develop in the gastrointestinal tract, and then it would absorb all the nutrients. So you would lose a bunch of weight, and you bet it's going to work. Uh, then after you lost all the weight that you wanted to lose, then it was a pill that would kill that, that tapeworm, and the tapeworm would come out the way anything comes out from your gastrointestinal tract. So, wow. Um, that would definitely work to lose weight, um, but I want to be sure I'm clear here. I'm not suggesting this as a weight loss approach, uh, but, yeah, I guess that would work. Anyway, so that's what happens is the tapeworm is, is absorbing the nutrients and so um, the human who has a tapeworm could be, could be becoming uh, malnourished during this infection. It is relatively easy to get rid of this infection. We do have medications that will kill off the tapeworm and it can come out. Um, tapeworms can get quite long. Uh, they can get meters in length so it can be quite an experience I would imagine. Now, this is what generally happens with Tania, is that humans are ingesting the larval form. There is, however, a much worse possibility, a much more serious possibility. Sometimes the human ingests the egg of the tapeworm instead of the larva. Now remember, Normally what happens is the cow ingests the egg, and I told you it became a larva that's very modal inside of the cow and moves to the muscle. Well, if the human ingests the egg instead of the larva, that larva becomes modal inside of the human, and it could migrate anywhere inside of the human. This is much more serious. It could go theoretically anywhere. Uh, it commonly likes muscle tissue, so it'll go to the muscle or the bladder, but it could go anywhere. It can go to the eye. I have this great picture uh, of a tapeworm larva forming in the eye, um, or it could go to the brain. It really could go anywhere. And now this is a much more serious scenario. Um, this could be a deadly infection depending on where the larva ends up. You're looking here at a cross section um, of a brain of a 14 year old girl after autopsy, obviously. Uh, and here's the larva that's forming here in her brain. It was deadly. That's a much more serious scenario. If you ingest the egg, that modal larva forms inside of the human, and then it could really go anywhere. A much more serious possibility. All right, let's talk about a trematode. Um, this is a trematode flatworms, but non-segmented. They are also commonly called flukes. Uh, the flukes tend to be named according to where they infect. So there's the liver fluke, the lung fluke, the blood fluke, etc., etc. Now, the flukes tend to have really intense life cycles. If you look at that picture, there's a ton of stuff going on there in that picture. Um, they, they tend to have really intense life cycles with multiple hosts, um, and almost always they require some sort of an aquatic host for their life cycle to continue. So a snail, right, or something like that that lives in the water ha are required for this life cycle to go forward. I don't want to go through the nitty gritty of a life cycle here, but I do want to bring to your attention one that we see in the United States. Uh, this is in the genus Schistosoma. Right? This is a blood fluke. Um, this particular organism requires an aquatic host such as a crawdad, mm, you guys call them crayfish, um, 
So it appears that crayfish um, in the United States can harbor schistosoma, so it is possible to get the blood fluke infection from ingesting undercooked crayfish. Um, uh, that, that's one possibility here. Now, a couple things that I always find so interesting about these trematodes. We do see differences between the male and female. Like if you look at the up here in this picture, um, the male is the larger one, kind of shorter but larger. The female is this uh, longer, thinner one. Right? They mate for life which is so interesting for an animal of that size. It's so unusual. Uh, but the male and female trematodes do mate for life. Uh, and in fact, the male trematode, he has this sort of fold in his body or, or envelope kind of structure, and he holds the female inside um, of his of his uh, body itself. So he, you can see the little line here. Um, where he's actually folding the female into his body fold there and they stay together for their entire lifespan. It's so romantic, isn't it? Anyway, here's a, a picture here of the male and female. Here's the male uh, trematode. This is schistosoma. Here's the female and she's folded down into his, his body structure there. Really bizarre. Anyway, the take-home message here, uh, the trematodes or the flukes, non-segmented flatworms, uh, they do absorb nutrients uh, and they require an aquatic host for their life cycle to progress. Let's look at some nematode pathogens here. Nematodes again are roundworms and roundworms have a true digestive tract where they have a mouth and they have a digestive tract with an anus on the other side. Now, the example we should all be familiar with living in the United States here, this is the pinworm. The scientific name for the pinworm is Enterobius vermicularis. Now, this is by far the most common worm infection in the United States. Um, it, it appears that about 20% of U.S. school kids have this infection, so it seems to be very, very common. What happens? The, the male and female adult are living in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, appear to live in the large intestine of the gastrointestinal tract. The female will migrate, uh, generally this happens when, when the host is asleep, and the female will migrate down to the anus, project from the anus, and she'll lay her eggs on the perianal skin, the skin right around the anus. So again, the male and female living in the gastrointestinal tract, the female migrates to the perianal skin and deposits her eggs on the perianal skin. Usually this is at night. Um, those, those eggs do itch, so the host will scratch, 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 um, and as they scratch, those eggs get caught underneath their fingernails. Right? Then they share a sandwich or play with some other kid, right, going from one set of fingernails to the other kid's hands into their mouth, uh, and now the kid in blue has, has the pinworms. They seem to be very, very easily transmitted from person to person where um, those eggs passed through, through contaminated fingers. And of course, why are kids so common? Because they don't wash their hands. They'll scratch their butt and not wash their hands, eat their sandwich, those sorts of things, uh, and pass it between other kids. He, the textbook author recently redid this photo, and I just find this so amusing. There, she's trying to show you that, that kids can also self-inoculate themselves. So here you see her scratching to get the, the eggs <laughs> under her fingernails, and then she's, she's inoculating herself um, by sucking her thumb. <laughs> so you can get a, a, um, multiple different adults living in the same gastrointestinal tract uh, as they're living together. Now again, this is a, a relatively common infection. About 20% of U.S. school kids have this. It crosses all socioeconomic groups. Uh, we don't see any uh, change across any socioeconomic group, so it's a very common, prevalent infection. Um, we, it doesn't seem to be very serious. These are very small worms. That's why they're called pinworms. It doesn't seem to be a very serious infection. If you believe your kid has it, 
usually it's because you see uh, worms or eggs um, in the toilet, usually is when people notice it, then it's very easy to cure, but it's not a very serious infection. In most cases, probably go undiagnosed. We think that people outgrow them. As they get older, their immune system gets better, and eventually they expel the worms all by themselves without treatment. But there is treatment available if you think perhaps your kid could be part of those 20%. All right, uh, this is the most common worm infection in the United States. Worldwide, the worst of the roundworm infections, and unfortunately one of the more common ones, this is Ascaris. Uh, Ascaris is, is uh, the genus, and there are several different species that do this. They cause intestinal roundworm infections. They're giant intestinal roundworms. I wish that they had... Um, some sort of a size indicator next to this picture so that you can see how large these are. Um, the width of these worms can get up to about the width of my little finger. So these can be some pretty seriously large worms. They don't get as long as like a tapeworm, um, but they can get, oh, about a foot in length, um, maybe a little longer, um, and as almost as, as um, large a diameter as my little finger. So what happens here is you ingest the eggs in contaminated food or water. The eggs develop into larvae in the intestinal tract, uh, and then they go on to develop into adults in the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes they, they do a little trip outside of the gastrointestinal tract along the way, but at any rate, eventually they wind up to be adults in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, unfortunately, what happens is as these worms are in the GI tract, they are absorbing food. They are eating the food that that, uh, that human host is trying to eat. Uh, so they're absorbing those nutrients. So this means that um, bodies who may already be malnourished, right? because unfortunately these infections are most common in parts of the world where people are more likely to be malnourished, um, if the patient is already malnourished and they have all of these worms inside of their gastrointestinal tract and those are absorbing any nutrients that they ingest. Uh, so this can be a really serious infection. It is possible to get heavy worm loads, in other words, more and more and more. In fact, that becomes more likely because you'd be releasing eggs in your feces and then you could self-contaminate or inoculate and get uh, a heavy worm load. Heavy worm loads, eventually you can get so many worms in the gastrointestinal tract that you are literally blocking function. No nutrients are being absorbed by the host, and you have a physical blockage of the gastrointestinal tract, which can eventually result in physical and mental problems and even death. I'll never forget one time I, when I was in a lecture uh, with the medical students at Loma Linda, they were showing pictures of these Ascaris infections, and they showed the picture of what appeared to be about a 13, 14-year-old uh, body uh, person, um, and they were face down in a cot, so you couldn't see very much, uh, but you could see that this patient had just been treated for an Ascaris infection with a pill that, that will kill off the worms, and the amount of worms that had come out of this body were unbelievable. I wouldn't have been able to get both hands around this bundle of worms. And they were about mm, maybe a foot and a half, two feet long. It's easy to see how that amount of worms um, can physically block the gastrointestinal tract and cause really, really serious problems to the patient. So these can be serious infections and cause death um, in some parts of the world. All right, this brings us to the end of the eukaryotic uh, pathogens lecture. Uh, again, I will talk some more, especially about fungus, protozoan, and algae in lab during week three, uh, but hopefully this lecture will help you get started on the eukaryotic assignment in the meantime. Okay, see you guys next time.